All right, well, good morning. Greetings, everyone. I am uh, somewhat chagrined today because the, as you can see, I don't have my tie on and my coat. I had them in my office ready to go with me as I came to the church. So I'm driving up Matson Road here. I was thinking about the things I'm going to do and, oh, I've got to put my tie on. And I said, oh, I left it at home. <laughs> so anyway, I... Uh, we are going to be, I'm going to be a little less formal in this session. I have the tie and coat out, so I'll wear them tomorrow uh, during the Zoom session. And uh, that's the way it'll have to be. So today, uh, we do want to mention uh, several things uh, before we get started. Uh, please do continue to pray for the Alder Leaston family. I had the privilege of being with them uh, yesterday at the graveside, uh, the funeral home they were working with very uh, severely restricted the number that could attend. And so it was uh, the two sons, their families, and me. And it was a great privilege to be a part of that service with them. Um, we also have uh, a graveside planned for uh, Grace, a new field, on Thursday at 10 a.m. It'll be at Royal Oak. I'm, I'll, we'll have more directions later. Um, but... Uh, they, their funeral home is allowing a larger group, so we'll work on that, and, uh, and there will be uh, some other instructions if you would like to attend. Uh, perhaps talk to Debbie uh, ahead of time so that you can uh, make sure that you know what the requirements are. And uh, we will return uh, next Wednesday to our First John study. The message then will be discerning between truth and error. Uh, that's the big uh, theme of this section that we're in, talking about false teachers, that confession, which is the test of the spirits. We're going to continue along that theme uh, on Wednesday night. And uh, I did, last week, I, I didn't write down any announcements. Uh, sometimes, you know, you're sort of, we're out of our routine, so there's things that you forget. And I forgot to mention last week, Friday was Cal's birthday, and he called me on Friday and I later looked it up and saw that it was his birthday that day. So happy birthday, Cal. Very belated. Sorry about that. And then also uh, two young men who are living elsewhere, uh, Rory and uh, Sean, Rory Johnson and Sean Tollington, are having, the, they share the same birthday on Tuesday. And uh, if you would like to send them an email, uh, please do so. If you need the email, uh, we can get that to you. And um, in any case, those are uh, the announcements. Now, what I thought we would do this week is return to our study of the book of Acts. Um, we, there are many topics that we could talk about surrounding the virus crisis. We've talked about some of them already. Uh, if there are things you would partic in particular like addressed, please do let me know. But I think that it's important for us to continue on studying the Word of God and getting the whole counsel of the Word of God. There's more to think about than simply uh, the virus that's uh, got everybody's attention. And certainly we need to think about what our lives are as Christians and how we relate to one another and to the world. And so uh, that's why I thought it would be good to go back to Acts as soon as possible. Now next Sunday is Easter Sunday. And so I think I should probably plan a special message for Easter. But, uh, but we will continue with the book of Acts unless the Lord directs otherwise through either some urgent request that you might have or uh, through uh, uh, just through my own study, things that come up that might uh, seem like the Lord would have us deal with that instead. So today we're going to go back to the book of Acts. And uh, I think that what we'll do uh, here is to just read our passage. Now, we are in Acts 15. I'm going to spend a little bit of time recovering uh, the, the background to this chapter and this section, and then we'll, uh, and then we'll get into what the, the text for today says. So, in Acts 15, I want to start reading in verse 19. and We're, we're dealing with the uh, response or speech of James. James is the Lord's brother. He's the leader of the church in Jerusalem. So we want to start there and go through to verse, uh, let's see, verse, what, is, what did I say I was going to start at? 19, that's my text. 
Actually, I think we should start reading in verse 13. And we will uh, go through to verse 21. After they had stopped speaking, James answered, saying, Brethren, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. Uh, with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After these things, I will return, and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen. And I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. And all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from long ago. Therefore, it is my judgment that we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles, but that we write to them that they abstain from things contaminated by idols and from fornication and from what is strangled and from blood. For Moses from ancient generations has in every city those who preach him, since he has read in the synagogues every Sabbath. Now, uh, let's first recover where we are in Acts 15. The prelude to the chapter, of course, is the missionary journey of Paul and Barnabas uh, to Crete and then into uh, the region of Galatia. So they went into Pisidia and Antioch. They went to Lystra and Derbe and uh, uh, those cities and Iconium. I missed Iconium on that list. Those are the major cities that they were in, but no doubt they were in many smaller centers as well as they traveled through that region. Now, uh, the catalyst to this meeting in the book of, or in the chapter 15, was on their return to Antioch. They spent some time there, and somewhere in that period, uh, men came from Jerusalem teaching that you must be circumcised in order to be saved. That's Acts 15, verse 1. And uh, so then the ch there was a great deal of dispute, and the church. And, the, and Paul and Barnabas had a strategy they wanted to follow, and that was to take the issue to Jerusalem and have the apostles make a definitive statement regarding this, a definitive public statement. Essentially, they're calling for a council of the leaders of the church in Jerusalem to come to this conclusion. So at the council then, there was much discussion and debate. Uh, and then Peter stands up, and his message is this. God approved the Gentile inclusion without circumcision. If we require circumcision, we are testing God. We are saved the Gentile way through faith alone. So that sums up what Peter said. The crowd, after Peter speaks, is silent. Uh, they are digesting what Peter says, and his testimony is so strong that they realize that, uh, I think, that the uh, advocacy of the Judaizers is... Uh, at, at best unwise and, and, uh, and really is contrary to what the revelation they have as Peter has laid it out for them. Then Paul and Barnabas are testifying to God's work among the Gentiles. Now that is, not, that is mentioned, but it's not recorded what they said. Uh, but I think that uh, we, can, we see Acts 13 and 14, probably they basically told that story. Uh, to show what God was doing and the many people who were coming to Christ through, through that event. And then James stands up and he turns to the scriptures first of all. And that's what we looked at last time uh, that we were in this passage. It came to this. The gist of James' message came to this. God used Peter for Gentile inclusion, something God predicted long ago as the prophets proclaimed. And so this is all in keeping with God's revelation. The, coming, uh, the, the, the bringing of the Gentiles into the people of God is, uh, is part of God's revelation. And in fact, we realize that, that uh, God is forming a new people in the New Testament, something that is, uh, uh, needs to be uh, emphasized as uh, they are grappling with this question. There's still... Thinking, some of them are still thinking of themselves primarily as Jews, even though they're believers in Christ. And so there's a correction in their thinking that's going to need to take place. Well, I've entitled this message, The Wisdom of James. And uh, this wisdom of James is going to really come to a head in his, uh, in his statement here in, uh, in the next three verses, verses 19, 20, and 21. 
And uh, they are going to become a guiding principle for church life in subsequent years. Uh, perhaps not always in the spirit that James intended it. If we study church history, we're going to find that uh, the Christian church is capable of turning spiritual principles into legalistic demands. Uh, although that's not the subject of our message, it's just a reality of the way things are. Now the German writers have a phrase or a term for this wisdom, this advice from James. It's, I'll try to pronounce it uh, properly, but I'm sure I'll mess it up. Uh, it's called uh, Jakobs Clausen. Jakobs Clausen. So in other words, James clauses. Jacobus is the Greek form of James. Uh, and um, it's, it's really the Hebrew word is Jacob. And so, um, uh, so in, in German it becomes Jakob. Okay, so Jakob's Clausen is uh, what these are called. I thought that phrase was just interesting. So the principles that he's laying out, the conclusion that he comes to is this wisdom. Now, James intended two things with his speech. One was the recommendation that Jewish Christians refrain from imposing the law on Gentile Christianity. He is going to come down on the side of Peter and Paul on this point. The, the law is not the guide of the, uh, of the Christian church. It has nothing to do with the Christian church. And the um, uh, second thing is that the recommendation of the, um, uh, that the Gentile Christians reform their lifestyle to accommodate Jewish Christian scruples. Now that part is going to be a little bit hard for you to grasp, I think. Uh, and it is, it is a little challenging. As I've heard this passage preached before, I've had some, I think, um, uh, I've had some perhaps wrong conclusions about exactly what James was recommending and why he was recommending it. And I hope that what we do today will help you clear up what James is actually saying, and then we can make some application to our life as to how it uh, applies to us today. So I'm going to put out a proposition for us today at this point in our message. The proposition is this. Christianity is not a come-as-you-are, stay-as-you-are religion. All right, that's the first part of the proposition. Second part is Christianity is a come-as-you-are, become-what-you-ought-to-be religion. So not come as you are, stay as you are, but come as you are, become what you ought to be. And the notion that you can have a Christianity without any expectation of change is a, is a notion from the world. It's not, a, it's not a biblical notion. God does expect us to change. Now, it's not a law in order to obtain salvation. We have to keep that distinction absolutely clear. But there are expectations of change. And there are expectations for behavior that go along with the Christian testimony. And I think that's what James is getting at here. And we'll talk about that as we go along in the uh, message. So the first point is the absence of entrance requirements. I'm driving that mostly from verse 19. It is Notice he starts off in verse 19 with, therefore. Therefore it is my judgment that. So he is grounding his conclusion on that which has gone before. Now, that would be his previous quotations of uh, Jeremiah, Amos, and Isaiah that we went over in the previous uh, message. In those, in those, uh, from verse 15, I think it is, 16, through verse 18, he's quoting from the Old Testament, from these three prophets. But it's not only those three prophets that mention the nations, the Gentiles being brought in. But uh, uh, throughout the Old Testament, we find these references. And then he's also, I think, uh, his therefore, we could say, points back even to Peter's testimony. Because he begins his speech in verse 13 saying, as Simeon, or as Peter has said. And so his uh, conclusion rests on what uh, the doctrine of Peter. 
and, uh, and the doctrine of Peter rests on the experiences that Peter had in Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 11. So the, uh, this, and then there's a, a prior history, and it's not mentioned here, but there's a prior history that James has had in interacting with Paul uh, in, uh, that is, I think, in the background of his statement here as well. And that's mostly revealed to us in Galatians, where Paul talks about his visits to Jerusalem, uh, his visit first with Peter and then James, and then later his visit with, uh, with the, all of the uh, apostles that were there gathered together, including James and Peter and others. And they were there, and they, uh, they agreed with Paul that he should go to the Gentiles and the kind of message he should preach and so forth. And so this whole prior history, when James says, now therefore, I believe he's resting certainly on those two things, the testimony of Peter and, and the word of the prophets. But I think the whole experience, he's summing up uh, for the church and for himself, this whole experience that they have gone through together as they've come to this point in church history. Now the content of James' recommendation is this, do not trouble the Gentiles. Do not trouble the Gentiles. The question was, shall we require Gentile circumcision to accept them as Christians? You know, we do believe in, uh, when we have people coming to the church, we do believe that they should give a, a good Christian testimony. But it isn't, there isn't an external requirement. We don't say, now, have you been baptized? Now, for church membership, we do. We have a requirement for church membership. But for salvation, we don't say, have you been baptized? Or have you been uh, going to a church? Or have you performed certain rituals, uh, maybe other than baptism? Or uh, There's no external requirement. And, and James, this is what James is affirming. We're not going to trouble them. We're not going to require them in order to acknowledge their Christianity. We're not going to require of them any further uh, actions for their salvation. And this word for troubling is interesting. One of the lexicons defines it to cause extra difficulty and hardship by continual annoyance. Uh, this is you know, the Gentiles are getting tired of hearing this uh, from some of these Jewish Christians. And so James says, we're not going to trouble them anymore about this. Now, uh, the requirement of circumcision, in fact, uh, is no help to the message of salvation. In fact, it's a hindrance to salvation. It makes Jewishness a prerequisite for salvation. Uh, this had already caused Gentiles to pause over Judaism. There were some Gentiles who were interested in Judaism. And uh, you've heard the term proselyte and also the term God-fearer. And the distinction between the two is that the God-fearer was unwilling to undergo the rite of circumcision. And uh, he was interested in Judaism. He liked the morality and the principles that it taught. Uh, he uh, perhaps had a respect and admiration for God, but they were having trouble with the notion of becoming fully Jewish to adopt the complete Jewish law. That bothered them. And this would be a stumbling block in the preaching of the gospel all around the world. Paul was quite well aware of this. And of course, that's why he opposed it so vigorously. And, and um, the... Uh, James, in his conclusion, is basically making the point that circumcision or any other ritual contributes nothing to the faith the, the apostles consistently called for. He wanted the Gentiles to turn to God. He says they are turning to God. Notice he acknowledges that in the verse. Uh, Therefore, it is my judgment we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles. This word turning is the same word Peter used in Acts 3.19 as he was preaching in Solomon's porch after the healing of the lame man. He says, therefore repent and return. That's the word. Return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. When Peter I healed Aeneas in Acts chapter 9. That's sort of an obscure story. The next one is the raising of Dorcas, which is more dramatic, of course. And so uh, perhaps it is uh, one that we slip over. But Aeneas was healed in Acts chapter 9. And it says that the people of that region, all Jews, turned to the Lord. So that same word. This is what they were doing. This, is, this word is a salvation word. We could call it repentance. 
obviously, turning is repentance. Uh, when uh, the Jewish evangelists went to Antioch in Acts chapter 11, they began speaking to Greeks who also turned to the Lord. So it's a salvation word. It's in, it's in use amongst the Christian church. And Paul in Acts 14 called the pagans of Lystra to turn from their idols to the living God. And uh, turning then is the objective of Christian New Testament preaching. Both Jews and Gentiles must turn from that which cannot save to the one who does save. So uh, for the Jews, they have to turn from this notion that the law can save them. The law cannot save them. They have to turn just as the Gentiles do. And the Gentiles, well, their idolatry can't save them. They're not only uh, uh, depending on a, uh, a, a false ritual to save them, but on a false god. So it certainly can't save them. And so they have to turn. So only turning to the Lord is what saves. Only that repentance, only that turning from the old and turning to the new, that's what saves. So James is concluding, let's not put any more stumbling blocks in their way. Let's Let's not trouble the Gentiles on the issue of salvation. That is the first part of his conclusion. The second part is an emphasis on what I call an emphasis on a transformative, on transformative principles. Notice how he starts verse 20. But, but. So this is a contrasting word. So I recommend we don't trouble them any longer. We're not going to impose the law on them for salvation. But... Okay, so there's a contrast. And in fact, this is the stronger of the two adversatives. As I was told, they're called. Uh, they're translated, but in both cases. But this is the stronger one. This is a very strong turn of the thought. There is more, something that James has on his mind here. And there's four recommended abstinences. So you see them there. We recommend that they abstain from things com uh, contaminated by idols. Uh, and from fornication and from what is strangled, and from blood. So these four things, these four abstinences. Now, let's talk about what they mean, the things contaminated by idols. Well, uh, Christianity, by its nature, calls for a turn from idolatry itself. You cannot, in salvation, faith in salvation is not simply saying, all right, well, I have my pagan idols, and I can add... Uh, uh, now Jesus to my list of gods that I follow. Uh, there's records of some people who followed many gods in the ancient world just in case. Just want to make sure they didn't miss one. And you have that altar to the unknown god in Athens as an example. And uh, the, the, the Jesuits uh, in India were notorious for uh, just adding the crucifix to the god shelf that the Hindus would have in their homes and counting them now as converts. Well, that's not conversion. If you're going to hang on to your pagan idols and worship them, you, you don't worship the Lord. In order to worship the Lord, you need to leave idolatry. But this, what James is saying here, is not leaving idolatry. He's not that turning to the Lord. It's something else. Notice that they abstain from things contaminated by idolatry. So anything connected with idolatry suffers pollution by idol idolatry. And I think, for example, we can especially note the food offered to idols. Now there's a long series of messages I have from 1 Corinthians on this. However, I want to note this. Paul, in 1 Corinthians, although he makes a concession that the meat is just meat and there's nothing actually wrong with the meat. He makes a strong case, as you work through chapter 1 Corinthians 8, 9, and 10, that you should not eat meat offered to idols knowingly. If you know it's offered to an idol, it, has, it is contaminated. It is unclean to you. All right? And I, I'm not going to go into that whole message at this time, but, 
But the, the, the point that James is making is something that Paul will later expound at great length and give uh, multitudes of reasons why this is a bad idea. But James is saying, we are going to call on them to abstain then from things contaminated by idols. And so certainly the food that would be uh, available as uh, the, after the uh, pagan idolatry uh, practices is certainly covered by this. And then there is the, uh, 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 there are no doubt other aspects of life that are contaminated by idolatry. All of those things should be expunged from the home. They shouldn't be retained. Uh, they, are, they, are, they contaminate the life. It's a, there's a spirit there that uh, ought not to be a part of, Christian, of the Christian testimony. And then fornication. Now, the Gentiles, and especially in the Roman world, understood the concept of marital fidelity. And in fact, the Romans uh, were, they had fairly strict divorce laws. And they were, uh, they were fairly, in, in terms of being faithful in their marriage, in their minds, they were faithful because they didn't divorce each other. Uh, not a very high standard. But the Roman men were quite free to have multiple mistresses and to engage in all kinds of uh, uh, immoral behavior. Now, this is especially in the ruling classes, I would say. But the, the morals of the Roman Empire and the Greeks before them were very low. So and they're very notorious about this. And uh, you don't have to do a lot of reading about that time period to find out the case about how people lived. And, uh, they, they, and so, so their standards were uh, uh, quite different from the Jews for certain. Now, so they understood the concept of marital fidelity and they would also have understood preaching about sin uh, would, uh, and excuse me, Christian preaching would, about sin would call out against adul adultery. Certainly, these things they would agree, they would have no problem understanding. But the word here is a broader word. Just as the, uh, the things contaminated by idols, this is the word not adultery, but porneia. So it means, it's a more general term for all kinds of immoral activity. The Gentiles, as I said, came from a very loose culture where one could indulge in many activities yet call themselves faithful to their marriage. So the, these first two abstinences do make sense to us, even though we are removed almost 2,000 years from the context. We, we really can get this, I think, as we think about what these things mean. The next two are a little bit harder. The thing strangled. You no doubt recall that in the law there is a requirement of the Jews that they not eat strangled animals. Uh, this points up back at least to Leviticus 17.13. Uh, there may be other passages as well, but this is one of the ones that's mentioned in the commentaries. Uh, verse 13 of Leviticus 17 says, So when any man from the sons of Israel or from the aliens who sojourn among them in hunting catches a bird, beast or a bird which may be eaten, he shall pour out its blood and cover it with the earth. And um, the, uh, no, I thought that was, uh, that was the one on strangling, but it is actually still part of the blood one. So we're maybe going to have to look at both of them together. Uh, uh, I maybe have the wrong reference down there. Uh, that's been known to happen and I don't have any way of fixing it right now in the midst of this message. All right. But anyway, the, you do know that in the law, they were told not to strangle things, not to strangle animals and then eat them. They had to pour out the blood, and that's certainly illustrated here with the requirement to pour out the blood. And then the requirement against uh, a blood. Well, we also remember this, and uh, it is something that we see in Leviticus 17. I'm going to read the wider context of verse 13, verses 10 through 14. And any man from the house of Israel or from the aliens who sojourn among them who eats any blood, I will set my face against that person who eats blood and will cut him off from among his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls." For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. 
Therefore I said to the sons of Israel, No person among you may eat blood, nor may any alien who sojourns among you eat blood. Then comes verse 13. When any man from the sons of Israel or from the aliens who sojourn among them in hunting catches a beast or a bird which may be eaten, he shall pour out its blood and cover it with earth. For as for the life of the all flesh, its blood is identified with its life. Therefore I said to the sons of Israel, you are not to eat the blood of any flesh, for the life of all flesh is its blood. Whoever eats it shall be cut off. Now, we do wonder about this. Now remember, James said, when James said, don't trouble them, the question might arise in our minds. Here's a part of the Jewish law, and he seems now to be saying, let's trouble them. You see what I'm getting at? Uh, and this same passage, by the way, in Le Leviticus 17, uh, in the same general area, teaches against idolatry and immorality. So there's some references in the notes if you care to look those up. Now, but we are wondering about this. What exactly is James uh, saying, and why is he saying it? Well, he does give us a reason. In verse 21, we have the reason. Notice how he starts. For Moses, from ancient generations, has in every city those who preach him. That's his reason. Uh, the word for points to the reason. He is not saying, we don't need to, uh, he's not saying something like this. Well, we don't need to give them the law. The Jews already have that covered. There, you know, that's not what he's saying here in verse 21. What he's saying instead is that in every city there are Jews who, uh, many of them have become Christians, but they hear the law of Moses in the synagogue and have heard it for many years. And uh, notice the, the time frame. For Moses from ancient generations has in every city, and through the Roman Empire, there are enclaves of Jews in pretty well every city that Paul came across. And, and, they, uh, and in their synagogues, okay, they, ha they are preaching Moses in their synagogues, in these cities all across the Roman Empire, for years upon years upon years, they've been doing this every Sabbath. So there are, what he's saying is that there are things about the Jewish conscience that are uh, very powerfully ingrained. And the question arises, should Gentile Christians persist in practices violating Jewish consciences? Should they eat, for example, meat offered to idols? Should they do that? If they were going to have a church dinner, and they say, I got a real special deal on this meat from the idol's temple, and, uh, and <laughs> we're going to have a barbecue, and, uh, uh, and we're going to expect everybody to be there. <laughs> and here come these Jewish Christians who for years, for years, have been raised to shun all aspects of idolatry. Or there's somebody who says, I made this great, you know, blood pudding. I don't know, I can't even imagine. I, you know, there are certain things that we just, though we can, we shouldn't, you know. But anyway... Uh, but they bring this to the to the banquet, and uh, the uh, should, for example, then the gent Gentile Christians practice a lower standard of morality. All right. Now, I don't mean that they should be immoral overtly, but a lower standard of morality than the Jews, the Jewish Christians. Would that be helpful to Christian fellowship in the church? Should they flout these dietary taboos, especially these tangentially connected with idolatry? In some pagan sacrifices, the method of kill, dispatching the animal was strangling. In some pagan sacrifices, uh, the blood was a part of the ritual. Consuming the blood was part of the ritual. Should they, uh, things that are connect, uh, connected that way? What James is saying is something like this. For us to function as a body, we have to live and love one another, causing no offense in the body. I've got some quotes from the commentaries that I think will help with this, and I'd like to uh, just go through them. First of all, uh, Polhill. He puts it this way, John Polhill. 
the question might be raised, why were the original decrees ritual rather than moral in the first place? So he's saying these are not moral requirements. It's not like it's actually a sin to eat this meat per se or to eat the blood even per se. All right? It's not actually a sin. Uh, the, the, the answer, Polhell says, quite simply is that the moral rules such as the Ten Commandments, were already assumed. All Christians, Jews and Gentiles, lived by them. All right? So those moral principles, they were required of everyone. The Gentiles needed no reminder of such basic marks of Christian behavior. So we're not saying that, that somehow these are concessions uh, to make you uh, do sort of a bare minimum of morality. Well, you Gentiles, we know you're pretty bad, but if you'll just do these few things, that's not what he's saying at all. Uh, so morality was not the issue of the Jerusalem conference. Fellowship was. Can we consider these people to be Christians? Can we work with them? Can we have fellowship? And the decrees were a sort of minimum requirement placed on the Gentile Christians in deference to the scruples of their Jewish brothers and sisters in Christ. You see what I'm saying? So it's not like, like if we start thinking about this as, okay, these are now requirements these are that, uh, for Christian behavior going forward. The moral requirements for Christian behavior are rooted in the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. All of those things still apply. You don't get away from God's uh, morality by being a New Testament Christian. That applies to Jews or Gentiles either way. Honor your father and mother. I, did I miss any? Uh, of, the, of the bottom six? You know, worship God, of course, and all of that. Don't have any idols. All of that is part of the Ten Commandments. All of that, those are moral requirements that, that, are, are, uh, that are required of humanity uh, in all ages, regardless of who you are. All right, but these are, what James is saying is, we have Jewish believers who have, are very steeped in a culture, and if we're going to get along, we're going to have to, the Gentile Christians are going to have to make us some concessions towards us. That's what he's saying. All right, so here's F.F. F. Bruce. Uh, and I'm going to use, he uses a Latin term. So I'm going to give you the definition of the Latin term next. All right, so let's hang in there. Don't get thrown by his Latin term. It is natural that when the stumbling block of circumcision had been removed, an effort should have been made to provide a practical modus vivendi, vivendi for two groups of people drawn from such different ways of life. What is a modus vivendi? Here's the definition from the dictionary. A feasible arrangement or practical compromise, especially one that bypasses difficulties. A manner of living, a way of life. In other words, it's adopting a way of life that removes barriers to fellowship. A modus vivendi, a way of living. A mode of living. All right? Here's Daryl Bach. As such, the list is not so much about the law as having a spirit of sensitivity about that which may cause offense. I think that this is really important for us to grasp. What is James saying? That, yes, we're not going to require the, Jew, the Gentile Christians to conform to the law in order to be saved. But also, we would ask that the Gentiles abstain from things that are going to offend Jewish consciences because of their long-standing training in the ways of Moses. Now, you might say, now, how does that apply to me? And how has this applied in church history? So we're going to continue now. Our third point is the continuing expectation of the law of love. So in church history, Christians took these standards very seriously. I have a quote here, fairly lengthy, from Justin Martyr, he's writing in his dialogue with Trypho. Trypho was a Jew. And he says, um, uh, Nay, also, I venture to repeat what is written in the book of Kings as committed by him, how through a woman's influence he worshipped the idols of Sidon, which those of the Gentiles who know God, the maker of all things, through Jesus Christ, Jesus the crucified, do not venture to do. 
but abide every torture and vengeance, even to the extremity of death, rather than worship idols or eat meat offered to idols. Now, Justin Martyr's writing in the second century, and the reason I offer this quote, he's, he's showing, he's arguing with his Jew, and he's saying that the Christians do not do as Solomon did. They don't eat, not only do they not worship idols, they don't even eat meat offered to idols. They are following the Jakob's Clausen. Okay, they're following the Jakob's Clausen. They are, they have made this a standard for their behavior. That's what the Christians came to do. And then we have Tertullian, who is in the, he's in a, uh, his apology, he's writing and he, uh, he describes very grotesque practices by the Gentiles uh, and the pagans. And he says, blush for your vile ways before the Christians who have not even the blood of animals at their meals of simple and natural food, who abstain from things strangled and that die a natural death for no other reason that they may not contract pollution so much as from blood secreted in the viscera. All right, so what he's saying is, the, the, this standard, now Tertullian is, I think, in the 300s. And they are, so for many years afterwards, these, uh, this advice of James, in fact, was followed. And I noted that, uh, that, in fact, the church turned it almost into a legal requirement in the early ages of the church. And a modern commentator, this is John Polhill again, says, the four requirements suggested by James were thus all basically ritual requirements aimed at making fellowship possible between Jewish and Gentile Christians. Often referred to as the apostolic decrees, they belonged to a period in the life of the church when there was close contact between Jewish and Gentile Christians, when table fellowship especially was common between them. In a later day, by the end of the first century, Jewish Christianity became isolated into small sects and separated from Gentile Christianity. There no longer existed any real fellowship between them. The original function of the decrees no longer had any force, and they tended to be viewed on holy moral terms. What that means is that over time, fewer Jews became Christians. There was an initial surge at this time, and then it ebbed, and uh, the choices had been made. And those Jews who became Christians really became absorbed into the Gentile community pretty well. And, uh, of course, there were some Jews over the, throughout all the ages who had become Christians, but the, the, the big wave of them coming in was in the first century under the apostolic preaching. Now, notice that Paul Hill says that these these principles became moral precepts. In other words, a new law rather than an accommodation of love. And so we have to be careful about what we set as standards. There are standards that Christians hold because they want to promote holiness. Uh, there, is, there are things that the world does. It, the world follows all kinds of crazy fads. Uh, especially in dress, in, in the way we conduct ourselves. And really, Christians, uh, Christians should not follow the world. They should be distinct from the world. And so Christians have, have uh, taught standards of behavior that, uh, that are, uh, are distinct. So, for example, uh, when I was growing up, most Christians did not go to movies at all. Most of, most of them didn't. Uh, when, uh, I mean by, the, by that, I suppose there were some that did, but most serious Christians did not go to movies, very rarely, if ever. Uh, I think I can count on my own, uh, from my own experience on, on one hand the number of times I've been to a movie theater uh, to watch a movie. And uh, you would laugh at the way, I'm not going to go through the list, you'd laugh at the ones that I went to. I think, but the uh, uh, and then uh, things like dancing. Of course, there's there's uh, moral uh, components to that. Moral reasons for for uh, ballroom dancing, especially, is what. Uh, and now, I'm not sure what they call the dance today, but it's certainly not ballroom, and it's it's certainly less moral. And so, serious Christians will say, okay, we we don't want to do that, and. And that became a standard amongst Christians uh, in their behavior. And so people who become Christians 
out of the world, uh, they are not required to perform any ritual in order to be saved, but they ought to love their brothers and perhaps abstain from things for the sake of the consciences of their brothers who are trying to live a holy life and remain distant from the world. At the very minimum, they should be living this way. This is a minimum requirement of consideration for other believers who have a very strong conviction about something. All right? And, and, and that is what's caused all this dissension and dispute amongst the believers here in the book of Acts. And the, uh, uh, so out of love, uh, there are things that, that might be stumbling blocks to fellowship that ought to be laid aside. Uh, it's not that we don't ever change, but there are, there are good reasons, scriptural reasons, for uh, holding to a spiritual Standard And so those who are coming in should make some consideration for those who are already in. Now it may be that some of those standards will change over the time. These are not laws, but they're guidelines, they're convictions, they're conscience markers. We need to be certain that our conscience markers are uh, rooted in the scripture, of course. And there's good scriptural reasons for holding to the standards that we do. But we don't just dismiss standards. We want to follow God's law. God's, not God's law, but we want to follow God as closely as we can. And Christians need to love one another. And, uh, and not, uh, it's not tolerating differences, but it's abstaining from things that I think are okay in order not to cause an offense with a brother. That's what James is calling for here. So, another quote, this one from Tom Constable. He says, James was not putting Gentile converts under the Mosaic law by imposing these restrictions. He was urging them to limit their exercise of Christian liberty to make their witness to unsaved Jews more effective and their fellowship with saved Jews more harmonious. You know, we have, I put in the notes here, we have political differences with the lost and with other Christians. Now, do our politics hinder the gospel? Now, it's, there's many venues, and I, there's many ways in which we can express our politics, and certainly I'm not saying Christians shouldn't have a political point of view. But, you know, when we come to Christian fellowship, uh, we should lay those things aside. That, that, the church is not an arm of a political party. It's not a, a place where we should try to convince somebody of the rightness or wrongness of our views, politically. Okay, you follow what I'm saying? And so uh, our political activity could hinder our evangelistic activity. Our political activity could hinder our fellowship between Christians. We need to be careful about what we do and how we live because we want to have, we want to pay attention to those things uh, that are scruples or are strongly held beliefs that are things that, that could cause division amongst the body which are not really gospel related. All right? It's not a condition of salvation. You don't have to belong to any particular political party to become a Christian. You know, uh, thank God for that. Uh, you, um, uh, or what about, uh, I mentioned already, lifestyle standard differences among Christians. Should lower standard Christians insist on their lower standards at the expense of the gospel or Christian fellowship? There is something about a high Christian standard that says something to the world that my life has been changed and I have a testimony to uphold before the world. And and uh, and I, I and uh, it is a light. It is a testimony that speaks to the glory of God. And so those who are coming in should learn to accommodate a uh, a higher standard of living. I would say, in order to uh, in order to have fellowship in the body and to promote the glory of God. I really believe that's what James is getting at with this message. So, 
uh, I think I covered this a little bit earlier, but I want to cover it again uh, before anybody asks me. Let me note that James is not arguing that standards of morality are optional or relativistic. These are not exactly moral standards that he's talking about here. These, are, these were um, rituals that Jews were accustomed, they were a ritualistic way of life that Jews were accustomed to. And uh, uh, the Bible makes it clear uh, that the requirement of a pure moral life, we've, I've mentioned that again, he may, the Ten Commandments, though they are not, uh, the, the Ten Commandments is not our direct authority for those moral principles uh, in the New Testament. The Ten Commandments are repeated in the New Testament. That's our direct authority if you follow what I'm saying. Uh, because the Old Testament, the Mosaic Law, is fulfilled in Christ. But he again reiterates, thou shalt not kill. And he again reiterates the, the sin of lying. You, you should, you know, it's wrong to lie. And so on and so forth. All of the Ten Commandments, uh, except the Sabbath, are repeated in the New Testament. And so these things are uh, obligations for our moral life. Uh, but... In this context, James is urging from the obvious to the less obvious. Obviously, Christians, new Christians need to abstain from idolatry in all its forms. Obviously, new Christians need to abstain from immorality in all its forms. But perhaps not so obviously, new Christians should accommodate themselves to community standards in order to promote a thriving Christian fellowship. All right, so I don't ha I'm not going to eat things strangled. I'm not going to eat blood. All right, the Jewish, the Gentile Christians, they're going to... They're going to make that accommodation. Is that such a big deal? It's not a big deal, is it? And these are the kinds of things that we're talking about. Now, we're skirting around. I'm not being, I haven't used a lot of specific examples, but this is to spark your thinking. Now, we're not advocating at all that, that morality is relative. Please don't, you know, we're not saying that. James is not saying that. But he is saying that we want to accommodate the, the, the certain standards in order to have Christian fellowship for the glory of God. I believe he's saying that. And in fact, that's the conclusion that they come to. And we will see par aspects of this reiterated uh, in the book of Acts and in other parts of the New Testament. So in other words, convert, converts shouldn't expect to name Jesus and stay the same. Changes should come. Changes should come. So my proposition, Christianity is not a come-as-you-are, stay-as-you-are religion. Christianity is a come-as-you-are, become-what-you-ought-to-be religion. Does that make sense? And are you following it? Are you allowing God to change you in the way that you live? Uh, in the process of grasping and appreciating Christian community standards, God molds the soul into a thriving Christian testimony. And I think he does. Now, salvation is by faith alone. There is no salvation apart uh, from the gospel. But that salvation does produce then a new life that is going to be changing. It's going to be adopting a new way of life and it may not adopt them and completely with understanding. It's just going to be called to adopt them. And I think we should do that. Well, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer as we close. And we will be, uh, we will be carrying on in the coming weeks. Our Father, we thank you for this time. We pray that you'll help us in our understanding of what James is saying. And as we look at it again, when we come back to Acts 15 and cover the letter that was sent out, and Lord, we pray that you will just help us to have a real grasp of what it is you're saying to us through these passages. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. While well, the Lord bless you, we hope to see you at the Zoom session. And then uh, we'll have another uh, message ready for you for Wednesday evening. And uh, we are praying for this coronavirus to come to an end and to... Uh, 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 <laughs> You know, I can't wait for the day when we, these things will be lifted. I hope it's soon. And uh, let's keep praying for that. All right, well, the Lord bless you. And we will close uh, at this point our session for today.